we doing, everybody, and welcome to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is a fantastic Thursday here in the great state of Wisconsin. My voice still hasn't come back. Been dealing with this cold. You guys know it. Yesterday was a rough one. Yesterday was a rough one. Today, I'm, we're going to make it through. And you know what? Today was such a big day. I had to bring in the big guns. I had to bring in the, not Austin. No, not Austin. Sorry, folks. Not Austin. But I got Rogan with me today. Rogan, we got a big day. We got a big day. The draft coming up today. We got the Bucks. They're going to be in action here. I believe Friday is game three of that series against the Pacers. So we got the Bucks to talk about today. We have the Brewers going on. How are you doing on this fantastic Thursday? Doing good trades. We only got a couple weeks of school left here. A uh, big couple weeks of Wisconsin sports going on between the Brewers, Packers with the draft, and now now this Bucks series that's got underway. So good good couple weeks coming up. Isn't it just, you know, it baffled me. I was thinking about it today, and I was like, how am I supposed to get back into football mode right now? I mean, I got the NBA playoffs going on. I have the MLB just starting up here. And now it's like, oh, we're just going to throw the draft right in between it. So now let's just get confused again. We we forgot about who's on the Packers team, but now we have to dissect who's on it. I mean, I just got into that mode today. But to start it out, I got a question for you. You're down there in Madison right now. And we're watching. I mean, I've talked about the last couple of days here, but we're watching this men's basketball team kind of, I mean, they're gone. Everybody's basically gone. I mean, we got, there's pieces coming back, right? But I mean, Chucky Hepburn, that was the last guy. That was the last guy I expected to walk out the door. And Chucky's gone. And now AJ Store, I heard today that he was already in talks with Illinois in like February about a, a negotiation for a deal to go to Illinois. Now, to me, that's stupid. That's, that's, should be tampering. Now, the NCAA doesn't care, but that should be some kind of tampering rule against that. But, I mean, A.J. Storr is gone. A season. He's on his way to Nebraska now. And, I mean, we've lost bench pieces, guys who weren't really seeing the floor at all anyways. But, I mean, guys are walking out of Madison, and I'm hearing a lot of targeting, right? We're targeting a lot of guys in the transfer portal, but I'm not seeing a lot of guys say, hey, I'm going to Madison. I mean, I see a lot in the top 10, but that's it. I mean, Frankie Fiddler, he's going to uh, Michigan State now. Chucky Hepburn, I saw he might be going to Louisville. That's the last place I saw him for crystal ball prediction was Louisville. So, I mean, Rogan, what, what's the buzz in Madison right now? And, I mean, is it an NIL problem? Is it a head coaching problem? Is it a little bit of both? What the heck is going on? You know, I think, I think it is a little bit of both. Obviously, I think this is the new day and age of college basketball here. It kind of, it's been a couple years for the batters, but I think just because we're so used to as batter fans having these guys stick around for almost the entirety, entirety of their career. But with this NIL stuff going, that's just, just not the case. And you've seen it a lot with these, these mid, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the Badgers is a big basketball program, but they're definitely not a small, they're kind of right in the middle there. And I, I think this is sadly going to be the new norm where a lot of, a lot of guys after every season are going to leave. These teams are going to look different almost year in and year out. And I think that's mostly an NIL thing, but I also think there's some coaching there too, because you look, I was the one I was really shocked with, with like you were saying was Chucky Hepburn. Never thought that guy would transfer from Madison. He just seemed like a guy that was close with Greg Gard. Obviously you have to be close when you're go from where he did as a freshman to being kind of the star guy in the offense to where he was being asked to kind of take a back seat to some of these guys. So, I mean, if you're not close with your coach, you're not willing to do that. So him leaving, I think, is I think that's got to be got to be a coaching thing there because I just don't see I don't see the draw from for for Chucky Heppard really in the transfer portal from some of these big time schools. I kind of see him making a lateral move to another school at the, about the same level the Badgers. So that so that suggests to me there might be some coaching there. But obviously AJ Stewart at uh, Kansas, uh, Gus Yaldin, freshman this year, never played. He's out. I think the total's up to eight. Eight players are transferring yeah. out this yep. year. A siege goes to Nebraska. Obviously, that's a coaching thing. He didn't play at all this year. You can't blame a guy for that. But, yeah, I definitely think it's a mix of both. And, sadly, I think this is going to be the new norm kind of going forward for the Badgers where these teams are going to look different every year. 
Yeah, I mean, well, we heard from Greg Gard, and he says, well, we've tripled the NIL money. Okay, if we tripled it, why is nobody thinking of Madison? I'm not hearing guys who are saying, yeah, Madison's on my radar. They're on my radar to head there. I really do think, like you said there, head coaching has a lot to do with it. Would you choose to go and play for John Calipari or uh, right now, can't think, his, his name is slipping me right now, UConn. His name is oh, Dan, Dan Hurley. Hurley. Would you want to go to play for Dan Hurley? Who's going to propel you to the next level? Who's going to give you the most of those years? And, well, I don't know if Greg Gard's that guy. Now, Greg Gard might be a good X's and O guy. He might be. He might be fantastic. I cannot say, you know, I'm not in the locker room. I can't say any of that kind of stuff, right? But what I can see right now is we don't get high-end guys to come. We just watched uh, Hunter, Tyrese Hunter from uh, – Texas there. He had the opportunity to come back home, right? The Badgers were talking about him. There was a wide open spot at the point guard position. He would have started right off the bat. He heads off. He doesn't come back home. Why is it? Why is it that nobody's even talking Wisconsin? Frankie Fiddler. I think that might have been the tipping point for Chucky. Frankie announced it after Chucky had already decided to leave, but I really do think because Chucky was pushing hard for Frankie Fiddler to come to Madison. And I just believe that Frankie told him, Madison's out. So Chucky's like, okay, we can't get Frankie to come. There's something, maybe Frankie said something to him, like, hey, I mean, this, something ain't right here. You're not getting your full potential. Because you look at a guy like this, and they said Chucky Hepburn's worth like 700000 to 750000 in NIL money. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's if Chucky Hepburn's worth that, what are some of these other guys worth? I mean, because Chucky Hepburn, he's a fantastic... I, I really do like Chucky Hepburn. I think he's a great point guard. And yeah, is he a great shooter at times? No. I mean, but who isn't, right? Tyrese Hunter is not a great shooter at times. But if that guy's worth 700000 how are the Badgers going to get anybody? How are they going to get anybody to commit to Madison? And that leads me to, we got to be able to put guys into contracts. You have to. Because otherwise, we're going to see guys like A.J. Storr what is it? He's been to seven different schools in his entire career now through high school and now into college. That's that's just stupid. That's ridiculous. You you cannot coach basketball if you do not have some kind of, I know this guy's, and now Greg Gard, I mean, he recruited two guys, right? You got Daniel Freetag and Jack Robinson coming in, but you have to replace six more guys off of your roster now. Six guys, and now you can't play, you can't plan for that. That's just like you're unloading. You're like John Calipari down there in Arkansas right now. I think he's got maybe three guys on the roster at this point. Like you're at that point if you are Greg Gard. I just, I don't know. I I mean, you're down there in Madison is, what's the buzz like? I mean, students, everything like that. What's the buzz like down there talking about Gard, talking about this program? I mean, they're loading up next year. The Big Ten is. You have Oregon coming in. You have Washington, USC. You have UCLA. The Badgers are trending towards the spot where they're going to be bottom half, like big time. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. In in, uh, in basketball, especially, people are defeated. I think people are really defeated. Like we saw all these guys leave, and then and then on top of that, we have the athletic board going out and extending guard through, I believe, 2029 which I think that was, for a lot of people down here, that was mind-boggling just because all you could hear last year was at the end of the season, like, if they don't have a big, big, big 10 tournament run, like, he's probably out of here. And then to have that, but then the first round exit in the tournament, a lot of people thought that there was a good chance he was going to be gone. And now you extend him for the next, what, five years? That was pretty mind-boggling. But, um, you know, I think as a coach, I don't – the Badgers the last couple of years have really gone to the transfer portal. And you start you listen to some of these good coaches like Dan Hurley and talk about the transfer portal, and they use it more as a way to fill in holes on the team. You, you have to recruit at a high level. And they say once you're done recruiting, that's when you go to the transfer portal. And if you need a shooter, you go after a shooter. If you need a, a defender, that you go get a defender. That's how UConn's won the last couple of years. And to me, it's the Badgers are like, completely relying on the transfer portal now when you're only bringing in two recruits and you're down and you lose eight I mean you're gonna have to bring in six seven guys from the transfer portal and and it's it's hard to tell with some of these guys because a lot of these guys the Badgers go after are from really small schools that had good years and bad conferences and we got lucky with AG Story he came here and had a great year but 
you don't know with some of these guys. Whereas you build through recruits and you at least get a foundation of players that in there, and then you have guys come and kind of plug and play and round out the roster like that. So it's going to be interesting. And I just, I don't know if that's a thing the Badgers can do. Like you're saying with the money, if Chucky being a role player is um, demanding 700,000 a year, I mean, that's just not sustainable at all for Badger basketball. No. And you know, you were talking there about recruiting and everything like that. And what other coaches do is a fantastic job of recruiting, but then building players up, getting them ready to go. What worries me is, yeah, we're bringing in this guy in Daniel Freetag, and he's supposed to be great, and Jack Robinson's supposed to be great, but can you throw them into a starting lineup right now and say, run with it? You know, the John Cale Perry's at Kentucky, we saw that. I mean, that doesn't work anymore. You have to be able to have experienced pieces out there. And that's where the Badgers were last year. They were experienced. I mean, you look at that roster, they were experienced. They were supposed to be really experienced coming back this year. And now it's like, okay, we're going to be throwing freshmen in there. We're going to be throwing Nolan Winter into Tyler Wall's spot and asking him to take on a boatload of the scoring there. And I don't know if Nolan Winter's – I mean, he might – I'm not going to say anything against Nolan Winter because he might have a big offseason. He might, you know, develop into this well-rounded big guy in Madison. But what worries me the most is that I have not seen anybody progress under Greg Gard. And if anybody wants to argue that with me, I know you and I, we we had a little tissy about that once, about the whole Greg Gard and uh, guys getting better. But, I mean, and, and I understood where you were coming from, where guys have – you know, developed but not developed, right? Tyler Wall developed. He got a little bit better with his moves, but he didn't get better in the essence of he didn't become more than a one-trick pony. And that's where I worry with Nolan Winter is, yeah, he came in like Stephen Crowell as a good three-point shooter who can score it around the rim, but we've seen Stephen Crowell go backwards. We saw Chucky go backwards. It really worries me that, yeah, we might be bringing in these fantastic recruits, but do they get better? Connor Asesian, I expected him in this last year to become, you know, one of the best shooters in the Big Ten. We didn't see him. We didn't see this guy on a team that was a terrible defensive team. We did not see Connor Asesian at all. And it's like, okay, well, why? Why is he not out there if he's a great shooter? I think Fred, I mean, Hoiberg down there in Nebraska, he doesn't care. They're not a good defensive team. They're just going to shoot the lights out. He's going to fit in just fine there. And I would hate to see him because that guy might torch us. So I don't know. Wisconsin basketball is in shambles right now. And I am, like I said yesterday, I'm waiting for some kind of notification on my phone to say, Wisconsin is getting this guy. That's all I need to see right now, because right now, all I'm getting is Wisconsin is targeting this guy. I'm sick of the targeting. I need to get somebody in here in Madison, because right now, they have a lot of holes. Like you said, holes to fill in the roster, they have a lot of holes. And right now, I don't think the recruiting trail is going to fill that for them. So with that, I want to get out of the Badgers. I want to. I got to mention a couple of our sponsors here quick before we move on. First, game day supply in on Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply in Onalaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at GameDaySupply.net. Also, your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy Sue or Anna to find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty, or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield. Also, Sports Scene sports cards and memorabilia stop in there in the marshfield mall and see al he has everything you need from sporting cards to memorabilia jerseys model stock cards he's got it all sports scene in marshfield wisconsin but with that we got to get into the bucks we've seen this bucks team game one was fantastic right we saw the bucks team that we were hoping to see the offense was explosive the defense i you know what really stuck out to me and I, I'm going to let you speak on this too, but the efforts in game one, they were all over the Pacers. I mean, the Pacers couldn't get an open shot. And when they did, they were rushed. They couldn't find any openings in this Bucks defense. They played downright fantastic. Then we came to game two and it flipped script. The Pacers put the pressure on the Bucks. The Bucks couldn't get any good looks off. Dame, I mean, we've seen Dame play some fantastic games in the first half, but in the second half, he has struggled. And it honestly is really surprising. I saw I saw the stat today. He has 61 points in the first half right now of game one and two. Eight points 
in the second half of game one and two. So the Pacers are finding a way to slow down Damian Lillard in that second half. And I mean, the Bucks got to fight. They got, I looking at the defense, they have to find a way to slow down Pascal Siakam. I don't care what you have to do. If you have to throw a double team at him, whatever it is, you have to leave Miles Turner open for three. Whatever you have to do at this point, you have to slow down Siakam because he is killing you left and right. So, I mean, Rogan, looking at game one and two of this series right now, what are you seeing out of this Bucks team that you like? And what's kind of worrying you moving forward here? Yeah, I mean, I'll start off with what's worrying me. Like you were saying, Dame in the second half has just has disappeared. And I was reading an article today, and it, it kind of made some sense. But I honestly think he's just getting tired. Like, I mean, especially with how demanding they've been, been of him on defense, I think he's just – I honestly think he's just getting tired because for how he's played in the first half, it's kind of hard for me to believe that he's cooled off that much in the second half. But, I mean, I think fatigue is just playing a big role because – and you're like you're saying, he scored eight points in the second half. He's yet to score a point in the fourth quarter in the first two games. And Damian Lillard is a closer. Like, that's what he's best at is scoring down the stretch. So that just shows me that, I mean – I. All his career has been great in the fourth quarter, so it's hard for me to believe he's been that off in the fourth quarter. I honestly just think he's tired. He's 33 now. I, I, I just think he's getting tired, especially like you were saying with the the pressure they've been putting on him. Honestly, the last three halves, even the second half of that first game, they started double teaming him, and you saw a lot of that again in game two. So I think he's just get, kind of getting wore down. And, and back to the Pascal Siakam, I just – like we were talking at the trade deadline, trade targets, I was talking, I, I thought they needed to go after a wing defender because they couldn't guard the guards, obviously. You bring in Pat Bev, I think that was a great addition. But we were still hoping that they'd bring in a long a long wing defender. And you're really seeing that now without one, how the Bucks are unable to guard a good wing, such as Pascal Siakam, which I think that's why down the stretch it's going to be I think the series is going to be decided on when Giannis is able to come back because he is a guy that would be able to guard Pascal Siakam. And I think if you're able to guard him, I, I, I just, the rest of this team is so young. And you saw it in the first game and a half. like They looked very nervous except for Pascal Siakam. He's the only guy that's had playoff experience. So I think the series is really going to come down to when we get Giannis back, if we're winning the series at the point, or how much we're down in the series – when he comes back, because other than that, there's just no one on this team to guard Pascal Siakam. But I think even more troubling looking forward to like a potential Celtics, a Celtics uh, matchup with the lack of wing defense that's kind of been exposed in this series. How in the world are they going to be able to guard guys like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown on the perimeter? I, I just don't know how they could do that. But it has been nice to see, like you're saying, the intensity on defense. It has it has been there. This Pacers team is the best offense in the league, and they they have gotten after him a little bit on the defensive side, and they're going to have nights where they're – I mean, to hold the Pacers to 110 points would be a good defensive night. That's how good of an offensive team they are. So it's. I think it's going to be – I think the series is going to come down to when Giannis is able to come back. You know, and you brought up an interesting thing there, and I talked about it yesterday here, and that is Patrick Beverly. Now, I love Pat Bev. I do. He's a great defender. I think he brings a good attitude to this Bucs team. But when you look at the scoring of the Bucs, when you look at the problems they have scoring the basketball right now, Middleton, I mean, he's been hitting shots, but not, right? He's been struggling. Brooke Lopez, been struggling. Bobby can only do so much off the bench and in his starting role right now. And then, I mean, you look at the other pieces, A.J. Green, Crowder, those guys aren't scoring. Connington, I thought, played well in a role in Game 2. But there again, he's not like he's going to light up the scorebook. So I love Pat Beverly in the lineup. But what I was talking about yesterday there is his lack of offensive ability, his lack to his lack of ability to hit shots for you. This Bucks team, when they were down big, he was in the ball game and he was taking some shots. But it was like I don't trust him to make those shots, right? And I look at a guy like Malik Beasley. Now he's not going to give you the same attitude. He's not going to give you the same uh, defensive tenacity that Patrick Beverly can bring, but Beasley can hit shots for you. So, I mean, to me, I like Pat Bev in stretches, but I don't think I can have him out there for extended minutes at a time, especially in a game or in a series against the Pacers where you're going to Indiana now. 
it's going to be offense. You're going to need the offense to show up, and you're going to need to hit shots. And I don't know, to me, if Patrick Beverly can step up and be that guy for this Bucks team. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I honestly, I won't even mind. I know he has. I know he's a rookie and he hasn't played much, but I won't mind Andre Jackson being thrown in there because that is the one guy in this team without Giannis right now that has a good frame and ability on defense to guard Siakam. So I mean, like you're saying, I think you either. I, I think you either need to go with offense with uh, uh, Malik Beasley there, or you need to bring in – I know Pat Bev's a great defender, but he's not the defender in the lineup we need right now. We need a long guy. So I feel like you either need, need, to, either need to go with a shooting in Beasley or you need to go with a guy that is able to guard Siakam because right now it's Siakam beating the Bucks right now. You look at the rest of these guys in this Pacer team, and yes, a couple of them had decent games in game two, but none of them – through the first two games have looked that comfortable except for Siakam. So I think you either need to go with a shooting of Beasley there, or I'd give, I'd give uh, Jackson a, a run, a run in, with the starters just to see how he holds up on Siakam. I mean, he, he can finish around the rim too. So it's not like he's going to be a liability out there on offense. No big time. And you know, you talked about, like we were talking the double team on Dame right now. Why can they do that? Nobody else can hit on this team. They don't respect anyone else on this team to step out and hit a shot, to drive the lane and uh, hit any. I mean, that's just where they're at with Milwaukee right now. They're saying to themselves, if we stop Dame, we stop the Bucks Because that's how it is. I mean, Brooks inconsistent, Middleton. The mid-range was there, but otherwise inconsistent for this Bucks team. So, yeah, you got to try something. You have to try something. And I know we talk about effort. I know for a fact if you put Ajax in there, he will give you effort. He is going to 100% try to lock down whoever it is that he's on out there. And, I mean, Beasley isn't a great defender, but he gets out on guys. He's going to at least put a hand in the face on some of these guys and be able to pester them just a little bit. You have to somehow make up for Damian Lillard not able to get open in these games here, and that's going to be one of those guys to be able to knock down big shots for this Bucks team because – I mean, Pat Bev might be able to get going. He might be able to hit you some shots, but he's not a consistent shooter. He's not a consistent shooter, and it's not going to end well if the Bucs keep relying on him to be that guy. He's not a P.J. Tucker. He's not. P.J. Tucker was long. He got after guys on the defensive end. He guarded up KD. I mean, he shut down KD like it was nothing. That was P.J. Tucker's job. That's how he did it. Patrick Beverly, a little bit undersized to be able to do things like that. So, I mean, we're moving ahead to game three here. That's going to be in Indiana for, they're going to be in Indiana for two now. And man, they have to show up with some kind of defensive intensity because heading to Indiana, that place is going to be a raucous crowd. They're going to be all over because Tyrese Halliburton, he was talking about this Bucks crowd saying how bad they were. I heard something about, they told one of his family members, they call them the N word or something. I, I don't know. I heard that. I, it's. Up in the air, like nobody, like there was fans who said, like, we didn't hear Milwaukee. that. Yeah, we didn't hear that. That's what they said. And it's like, so who's telling the, I, I don't want to say that anybody's lying. I don't want to say that he's lying. But at the same time, it's like there was fans sitting around that same guy who apparently got moved. And they're like, he didn't say that. He didn't say a word about that. So, I mean, that could be Bucks fans having Bucks fans back there too, right? I mean, but you're going to have a raucous crowd. How are you going to respond to that? And I mean, what are you looking for game three of this series from the Bucks? What do you got to see? What do you, I mean, we talked about it a little bit there, but what do you have to see in this game here for the Bucks to pull off a win? I got to see some of these bench guys get it going because like you said, Middleton had a good game one, not a great game two, but he's given you decent, decent numbers for the first two games. Lopez, not a great game one. Pretty good game. Pretty good game yesterday. I think he had six threes or whatever. Bobby had a rough had a rough game, uh, game two, but a good game, game one. So and Dame Dame needs to get it going in the second half. I need to see him down the stretch. I'd rather have thirty points in the second half than thirty points in the first half. But other those four between those four, they've been pretty consistent through these first two games. It's these bench guys, you know. AJ AJ Green in that first game, three wide open looks from three, couldn't hit any of them down. Connington had some really good looks. Couldn't hit any of them down. Beasley's been, ever since the All-Star break in that three-point challenge, he's been really struggling from outside. Nothing compared to what he was in that first half of the season where it felt like he couldn't miss at all. So I, I need to see these role players get going because 
it's role players that win you championships. These these stars will go out there every game and give you the, the numbers that you need, but it, it comes down to these role guys. And I think with this Pacers team, because they like to run, they like to run a lot. So you kind of saw in that game too, or some of our starters kind of got a little tired, but I just don't think Doc has enough trust in the bench guys right now to go in there and put quality in a minute. So I need to see, I need to see some good numbers out of the bench guys for sure in this game three. 100%. Everything you just said there was spot on. And yeah, transition buckets. They It was like 14 points they had in transition, but I said that stat was a little off because it seemed like when the Pacers were out and running, it wasn't counted as a transition bucket, but they were swinging the ball fast and it led to open shots. The Bucks got all kinds of out of sorts and they weren't able to defend. I mean, 100%, I think this game three is the pivotal game of this series. I have to be honest. Because if the Bucks go down two games to one in Indiana, game four of this series, with that possibility of going down three to one in the series to the pay, I, I really do think this game is, it could be for all the marbles. I really do think. I mean, yes, Giannis might come back later in the series. I don't know if he'll be back for game three. It sounds like he hasn't practiced yet. So, you know, hopefully that game, I believe they play Friday and then Sunday. Hopefully that game Sunday, he's back, but that's far stretched at this point. But I mean, you go down two games to one to the Pacers, a team that's had your number. What have they beaten them four out of six times now this year? I mean, five. Rogan's muted over on his end. I can't. Uh, five out five of seven. Five out of yeah, seven. Yeah, they played them five times. And, yep. That's even worse. That's even worse. We're getting more games and less wins. I mean, five out of seven times this Pacers team has taken care of the Bucks. They have your number. You cannot go down two games to one because then you have one more game in Indiana yet before you go back home. You go back home down three games to one. We just watched the Pacers, I mean, offensively obliterate you at home. It's going to lead to a rough shot in game four. That's for darn sure. But I mean, optimism, right? Optimism. The Bucks have played well. They have played well in both games of this series. It's just game two, the Pacers couldn't miss, right? The Bucks got it down to like three. They brought it all the way back and got it down to three in that third quarter. And I was like, here come the Bucs. The fans were into it. It was a raucous crowd. Everything was going momentum towards the Bucs. And then it just seemed like the Pacers had an answer. Every time the Bucs put on a run, the Pacers had an answer. That's where the Bucs have to be in this game three. They have to be able to answer the Pacers. I mean, that uh, possession by possession, basically. They have to be able to hang with the Pacers until late, and that's where Dame turns it on, right? That's where they need Dame to turn it on. So second half, like you said, is going to be huge for Damian Lillard in this one. So we're going to get more into this pacers Bucks game. We got the preview show for the weekend coming up tomorrow here, so we're going to get into it more then. But with that, I want to mention the last couple of our sponsors here quick before we move on. First, we have Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. If you've been injured recently, whether at work, basketball court, baseball field, softball field, whatever it was, and you need some physical therapy, stop in there and see Chad at Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood. He will get you right. He'll get you back to work, back on the court, back on the field, whatever it is, he'll get you back there. Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. Marshfield Motor Speedway is located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County Road H. You got to get down to the track this summer here. Tons of family fun down there for all ages. Great food, great drinks, great racing. All the family fun you need down there at Marshfield Motor Speedways. Find the schedule on Facebook. Just search Marshfield Motor Speedways or online. Search Marshfield Motor Speedways. Takes you to the website. You can find the schedule there. And also Pittsville Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. Stop in and see the awesome crew at Pittsville Farm and Home Center in Pittsville, Wisconsin. But with that... Let's talk Brewers. Let's talk Brewers for a minute. We're just going to get into the Brewers a little bit here before we talk about the Packers. So the Brewers, I mean, they're off to a pretty good start, right? We're watching the game as we're recording this right now, playing the Pirates there in Game 3 of that series. They've had a little bit of a skid, but, I mean, looking at this Brewers team at a whole, a lot of surprises. We did not expect this Brewers team to be at the point that they are now. Looking at the players' side of it, Who has been the biggest surprise to you to start this season for the Brewers? Um, I think the biggest surprise so far, I I would have to go with the guy, um, Blake Perkins. He's played 
I know he's only he hasn't played all the games, but through 16 games right now, he's batting uh, 309 center field. So he's been he's been playing really really well as of late. And another guy I know I know this isn't a big surprise just because he's been a good player, but Wilson Contreras is just ripping the cover off the baseball this year. I mean, it, it, you can argue right now through 24, 25 games that he's had he's had the best hitting year of anybody in the MLB so far. I mean, I know they were showing some stats about his exit velocity being second. And for a catcher, I mean, catchers aren't really – I mean, there's some great batting catchers out there, but catchers are by far not really known to be great offensive batters by any means. It's usually your outfielders and your uh, infield guys that take that crown. But – 356 through 24 games. I mean, he's hitting the long ball. He's squaring up a lot of baseballs right now. But so I'd say between Blake Perkins and Wilson Contreras. And I also got to throw a shout out to everybody on the starting pitching except for Freddie Peralta. Because we knew Freddie Peralta would be a good pitcher this year. But those other pitchers in the starting starting roles have really done quite well for what we expected through the beginning of this year. I know none of them are outstanding guys but we just needed them to be able to limit these offenses to two or three runs to start and so far fingers crossed that's what they've done especially as of the last week and a half our pitching has been phenomenal I know the offense has cooled off a little bit over the last week but the the pitching has been there over this last week so I'd say those are my biggest surprises so far yeah 100 I mean every single one of those guys you named has been fantastic I gotta say Bryce Terang Terang has been hitting phenomenal. He's got, uh, I think he's still second in the league in stolen bases right now. I mean, he's hitting 315. The guy has been ridiculous to start the year, and it's all because of that big knob on his back. It's all because of the big knob now. They said, I, I heard the story, they said he was waiting for his bat in the mail, and it was just your normal standard handle on it and everything like that, and his mail was late. The bat didn't come, the bat didn't come. Well, his buddy had this bat. This one with the big knob on it. And Bryce is like, all right, I'll just use that to take a few hacks here and there. And he fell in love with it. So now that's the style of bat he uses. So I thought it was a real, I mean, United States Postal Service screwing over somebody. So now they're hitting well, right? I mean, that's all it took. That's all it took for him. But also, Willie Adamas. Now, in this game, he's down. I'm I'm looking at the box of this game against Pirates tonight. He's at 281 right now. But from what we saw last year out of Willie to this year, the guy is like night and day different. Using all facets of the field, hitting the ball around, not just looking for the home run ball, but driving the baseball, patient at the plate, not chasing everything. That's what we wanted to see. That's what we're seeing out of Willie right now. So it's been fantastic what we've seen out of Willie Adamas so far. And then, like you said, the pitching staff, I mean, we're injured right now. We're injured up to Wazoo, Wade Miley. We talked about it yesterday here. I don't know if Wade Miley's coming back. I really don't. The way that he gave that presser about the elbow inflammation, really, he was dang near in tears, made it seem like Wade Miley might have pitched his last time for the Brewers and in the MLB. And I mean, but outside of that, Colin Ray has pitched fantastic. I think that is one of the most underlying guys in this rotation outside of probably Joe Ross. Joe Ross has pitched way above expectations for a guy who hasn't gotten a major league win since 2021. And now he's given us five innings a piece here of pretty good pitching baseball right now. So, I mean, that has been my biggest surprises right now is just some of the guys who, you know, you really didn't expect them to do fantastic. but. They figured it out. They figured it out, and here we are. So Brewers right now leading the division. Do we think? Do we think that the Cardinals will finish in last? Do we think the Cardinals will finish in last? They're there right now. You have to figure at some point they're going to figure something out. But right now, sitting in last place. What do you think, Cardinals? Do they finish in last? I I think they do. I I just this offense. This offense for the Cardinals this year has been struggling mightily. They do have some good good pitching, but I just you know, you look at these other four teams. I think the Brewers have a better overall team. I think the Cubs are, but I think the Cubs are going to be good this year. I think they're only going to get better. I think they have an overall better team. I think the Reds this year have a halfway decent team. You know, you look at this Pirates team, and when's the last time the Pirates started this good? I mean, they've got a they've got some good young prospects. They've got a good team. I just don't see – I think the Cardinals will get it going a little bit, but I just honestly believe these other four teams in 
division are better than the Cardinals this year. And you've got a lot of these guys this between Goldschmidt and uh, who's the third baseman for the Cardinals? Arenado. Ar- Arenado, he's struggling this year. Goldschmidt hasn't got it going. Um, Contreras, Contreras has been pretty good this year so far for them. But I just, I honestly just believe the other four teams in this division might be better than the Cardinals this year, which is probably, I mean, when's the last time the Cardinals were, were, are going to be the worst team in the NL Central? The Pirates want remember. to duke it out for them. They'll try and duke it out for the last place spot. They'll try. I think the Pirates have a semi-decent team this year, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that so, starting pitching yeah. staff for the Pirates has been very good. Like, very underrated. I mean, some of the guys we've seen against the Brewers here are just ridiculous. They're young, but they're ridiculous. And obviously, I think Arenado, Goldschmidt, they'll turn it around. They have had horrible starts to the season. They'll get it going, but... You know, I was watching that Brewers Cardinals series, and other than those couple guys at the top there, that that offense is looks pretty dead to me. One hundred percent, I gotta agree with you. I I really could see if the Pirates don't completely drop off the wagon, I could see them finishing above the Cardinals this year. And that's really, I mean, that's surprising because you look at a team like the Cardinals historically, and that's a top of the division team. That's a good team, and it's not like they don't have decent pieces, but man, I, they just can't figure it out there. So, I mean, let's get out of baseball. Let's get out of baseball. We want to get to what we're here for today, and that is the NFL draft that is coming up tonight here. Packers, they got a lot of draft picks. Uh, looking at it, they have the 25th pick, the 41st pick. They have 58, 88, 91, 126, 169, 202, 219, 245, and 255. They have a lot of picks in this draft and a lot of them compository picks there uh one from alan lazard and then jaron reed and then dean lowry gave him a couple picks there but i mean looking at this packers team we've talked about it before here on the show some of their needs so we look at that 25th pick now we talked about cooper DeGene a while back sounds like cooper DeGene might be gone if the packers don't decide to move up here and get him off the board early on in this one so looking at that 25th pick we know the Packers needs a a little bit of what this Packers team needs out there where are you leaning right now who's a guy that 25th pick that might be the guy I'm I'm stretched or are you trading up and trying to grab a guy where are you looking right now in this 25th spot you know I think Cooper DeGene would be a great great player but Honestly, in my opinion, I think there's still good enough free agents on the safety market between like a guy like Justin Simmons, who was just a couple years ago thought to be the best safety in the entire league. And he's only 30 years old. Like that's a guy that's still available out there. So I'm kind of and uh, I think Xavier McKinney, that was the guy that he was the safety opposite of the safety we just signed from the Giants last year. So I think and he's a pretty good safety as well. And he's only 25. So. You know, I was kind of hoping the Packers might try to shore up both those safety spots through the free agent, free agency there and focus more on these to the offense and defense line. Because to me, like you're saying, with uh, Cooper Jean there, I think you're going to have to trade up to about 18, 19 to be able to get him. Because I've seen a lot of mock drafts. That's kind of where they have him going. Now, some of them have him falling almost all the way to the second round. It's so you never know. But I think that guy's too good of an athlete, too good of a player that he's going to fall to 25. I also look at a guy like uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry, who I think would be a great player for the Packers. I don't He's not as versatile as DeGean, but would be a great guy for in the slot there for the Packers to pick up. But And I, I think there's a very real possibility they trade up. They've got 11, 11 picks, I think, in the first like 100 or something. It's insane how many picks they have in the top 100. So they've definitely got the, the capital to do it. But you know, I wouldn't mind the, the Packers sticking around at 25. And if a guy like Cooper DeGene's there, great, go ahead, draft him. But I look at some of these tackles that are kind of projected to be available between Graham Burton, tackle out of Duke, um, Tyler Guten from tackle out of Oklahoma. Like, I, I think the thing that's not being talked about enough because we signed Jacobs, we, sh- we signed that great safety, but we lost quite a few pieces on the offensive line this offseason. And they're Looking at our two starting tackles going into next year between Zach Tom and who's our who's our right tackle? It's Zach Tom and Run is it Runyon? No, not Runyon. Sean He's Rod. guard. 
Ryan's in there, isn't he? I think so. I thought it was Ryan. Yeah, but I mean, even if it even if it's not Ryan, you look at those two tackles and Zach Tom's a good player, no doubt. And I think they're actually talking about possibly moving him to center. I yep. saw a lot of reports about him going to center. They think he can be an all all pro type center, but you can't do that if you don't get another tackle through this draft. And I just don't feel comfortable right now with the tackles that we have on this Packers roster. And who knows? They might if they go with Dejean and the first round, you still have a lot of picks left. You can you can find a lot more tackles in that second round, but I I think it's you got to find a good balance between what it would take to possibly trade up to get a guy like Cooper Dejean and what we'd lose in potential picks for getting some help on this offensive line. And I also wouldn't mind drafting that defensive tackle um, out of Illinois. I think is Jernane Jer- Newton, I believe, okay. D tackle. Because this Packers defense needs some help on that defensive line for sure. So, yeah, I don't know. I think I'd love a guy like Dejean, but I, I don't know what the cost is going to be to move up seven, eight spots to get him. And I think the Packers could could be just fine sticking around at 25 and taking one of these tackles. I love the tackle talk. I, I really do think the Packers could use a couple in this draft here. The guy that I'm looking at, though, that not a lot of people are looking at for the Packers, and that is a guy coming out of Clemson. He's below Cooper DeGene. He's the fourth-ranked uh, cornerback there, Nate Wiggins, 4.2840. 4.2840. This guy's 6'1", 173 pounds. So you imagine he could probably get himself up to 200 there, so he could be a pretty solid cornerback out there. Very good at smothering receivers out there. I mean, watching his highlight tape, this guy is all over the field. He gets into the backfield. He can slow, He's a bigger guy. He can slow down some of these receivers, and he can keep up with the best of them. I don't know what Tyreek Hill's 40 time is, but 4.28 sounds pretty dang fast to me. That's all I know. 4.28 sounds fast. So I think Nate Wiggins could be a guy that if he fell to the Packers at 25, I would not be opposed to it. You would have a lockdown corner in Jair, and on the opposite side of the field, you would have Nate Wiggins. Because I just, Eric Stokes, to me, I never know. We haven't seen him get out there. He's been injury riddled. And as of late, I I just don't know what to expect out of Eric Stokes. I mean, I hope that he turns out to be a guy, right? But I don't know. So, and then you have Valentine and Valentine coming back there, but this is a guy you can add in that cornerback room, and he's going to make an instant splash into your team. That's if Cooper DeGene isn't there. Like you said, Cooper DeGene's there. You don't even, it's no hesitation. You grab this guy in Cooper DeGene because that is, he's a different kind of guy. He's a ball hawk. He's all over the place. He's like a Morgan Barnett kind of guy. He's all over the place. He's going to get into the backfield and make things happen. So, I mean, I, that's a guy I'm looking at is Nate Wiggins. But yeah, like you were talking there, you can never have enough tackles. You can never have enough tackles. I don't think, you know, Joe Alt would be fantastic. I don't think he's going to be there. But you look down the list here. You have that Fuga guy coming out of Oregon State. He's solid. Jordan Morgan coming out of Arizona played solid this year. You have Joe Alt or uh, Alt's opposite there in Blake Fisher coming out of Notre Dame. He was fantastic in this last year, ranked in the eighth spot right now. So there's a lot of pieces you can pick in this draft or offensive line-wise because right now, I mean, you look at the top 10 picks, there might be an offensive tackle taken in there. But, you know, you look, you're going to probably see, I mean, Caleb Williams, then you're probably going to get Jaden Daniels, then you're looking at Drake May. We don't know what the Vikings are going to do. They might trade up and grab on to... Uh, J.J. McCarthy there. McCarthy. And then you're going to have Marvin Harrison heading to Arizona there. We know that. I mean, we don't know that, but we're pretty darn sure of it right now, where all these guys are basically heading. So outside of that top 10, that's where you're going to get into a lot of these tackles. And that might drop Cooper Jean further. That might make him avail. I, I don't know. I don't, you know, that's the great part about the draft. Surprises. There will be a lot of surprises, and we might see one in this one here where it's like the Texans last year where they're jumping up and they're grabbing two guys in the top three. Like, that was ridiculous moves by Houston last year. We might see that again this year here. So, I mean, let's get – we're going to stay with the draft here. Looking at the Bears. The Bears, we know they're going to grab Caleb Williams, right? We know they're grabbing Caleb Williams. With that nine spot then, you have your options, right? You can grab an offensive lineman. They desperately need offensive line help. You can grab a wide receiver. I believe 
who was that receiver that I saw out of Washington, right? Odunze. 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 They were talking at the nine spot there. And, I mean, you have – there's a lot of good receivers in this draft here. Xavier Worthy is actually ranked as the number eight coming out of Texas there. But Xavier Worthy is a fantastic receiver, and he lit it up at the combine. So Xavier Worthy is still probably going to be there. I mean, I just want to know from your perspective – if the Bears get Williams, and let's just say they go and they grab a Dunze, is this Bears team like, are they ahead of the Vikings now? Are they competing with the Lions and the Packers? Like, the defense for the Bears isn't bad, right? But the offense, the offensive line's terrible. You know, they can't figure it out at quarterback. Maybe Caleb Williams is the guy. I have never been sold on Caleb Williams personally. That's just my opinion on the guy. I just something about it just screams to me Johnny Manziel. Something about him just screams Johnny Manziel to me, and I can't get over that. Baker changed, though, right? Baker came in with that kind of same attitude, but I think Baker's really mellowed back, and I love what he's doing in Tampa now, but I just get that with Caleb Williams. So, I mean, to you, they get Williams, probably a Dunze like they're expecting in that nine spot. Is this Bears team competitive in the North? I, I hate to say this, Strange. I hate because I hate the Bears. I hate them so much. I hate the city of Chicago. We all do. I hate the Bears. I hate their colors. It's I hate the stadium. I hate everything. But I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. I think they might go a Dunze, but if I'm the Bears, I'm taking Caleb Williams, and then I'm taking my favorite player in the entire draft. I think this guy is being completely overlooked, but Brock Bowers out of Georgia. Oh. Yeah, I think he helps you in two areas because, like you're saying, their their offensive line not great last year. They added a couple pieces in free agency. It's going to be a little bit better. Guy is an elite pass catching uh, tight end, but he's also going to add a great blocking component to help your offensive line. So that's kind of filling two holes on this Bears defense. And you know, I look at a team that has, like you're saying, I'm not a big Caleb Williams fan. I don't think you can deny his talent. Like you watch yep. this guy throw the ball. He's definitely got talent. It's the personality side that I think is going to decide how good he is an NFL quarterback. Quarterback, and he's going to have to I think he's going to have to change it a little bit. But I look at a Bears defense that over the last ten games this season last year was top five in the NFL. Great defense last ten games. Then you look at a Bears offense that Caleb Williams at cornerback. I think they just signed. Did they just sign Swift? Yeah, they got. I think Swift. they signed Swift yep. from the Eagles. Yep. Swift at running back. Not a great offensive line, but an improved offensive line. You got DJ Moore at wide receiver. You just traded for Keenan Allen. You got Keenan Allen at wide receiver. Now you plug in Cole Komet. They also got him at tight end. You draft uh, Brock Bowers. You got a Cole Komet, Brock Bowers combo at tight end. That's that's going to give any tight end combo a run for their money, money in their league. Or you go with a guy like Adunze, and you could argue between Adunze and DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, that could be the best three wide receiver group in the entire NFL up there with the Texans. And, you know, you look at a defense that was playing better and you add all those pieces on offense, I think they're probably going to start the year slow. I think it's going to probably take them time to get it going, but th that's a scary team. That's a really scary team, especially with how well that defense is playing. They can keep them around for the, f the beginning of the year until the offense figures it out. But if that offense gets going, man, I – I don't think there's a team in the division that can guard them, let alone – I don't know if there's a team in the NFL that could guard an offense like that. Obviously, I think Williams is going to have his growing pain, so maybe not next year, but you look at the future of this Bears team, and, I mean, they're, they're looking scary. Yeah, and, I mean, the Vikings, they could drop out of – I mean, they could be last place in this division here pretty soon. A Vikings team that was oh. destined for something good and just falling apart at the seams. Justin Jefferson, I don't think he'll put up with it for long. He's going to want out of there. And, I mean, that team is falling apart right now. I Look, I, I can't deny what you said about the Bears there. And, I mean, they're – that's where I, when you look at the Packers, it's like, it's screaming, we need to add defense. We need to add defense because we got to be able to compete in this league now. And that might be where they have to lead now. Maybe they have to take the risk and move up in the draft and grab Cooper DeGene. Maybe that's the thing the Packers have to do here because they just got to, you got to be able to slow down the Bears, right? You need playmakers on the defensive side and that, that might be where they have to lean. Yeah, I got one more thing talking about the draft there. You know, I've been reading some stuff, and 
I think the group we're not talking about enough right now on this Packers team is the linebackers. I mean, outside of Quay Walker, this linebacker group is weak. I mean, you look at a lot of the rest of these guys and not a lot of experience there. I know uh, a couple of these guys played last year, but again, none of them were great players. So, I mean, outside of Quay Walker, that rest of that linebacker room is really, really shaky. So I know this, this, this draft this year is really poor in the linebacker room. I don't think there's a single guy positional, positional ranked inside the first round for linebackers, which kind of gets me thinking, like, could we see the Packers take a linebacker? Because, you know, if you don't take a linebacker day one with how weak this group is, after the first two or three guys, like a lot of these guys are fourth, fifth rounders, and the Packers are in desperate need for a day one starter. So I, I kind of look at a guy like Ed, Ed Jurian Cooper, linebacker out of Texas a and I think he's the 50th overall prospect in the draft, but with how weak this draft room is for linebackers, you could see these teams possibly taking linebackers sooner just to make sure they get a good linebacker. So I know that wouldn't be the – I don't think that would make a lot of Packer fans happy. I wouldn't be surprised because, honestly, you look at that room, and I think that might be the weakest room on the Packers roster right now is that linebacker group. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And, I mean, looking at the draft board, I was just looking through it there, and it is bad. The linebacker group in this draft is bad. I mean, you're talking about the 25th best linebacker in this draft is uh, Nia John Menta from Wisconsin. And, I mean, he's a good linebacker, but he's not great. And, you know, you look up this draft board, I mean, you get into the top six, and the six best linebacker is ranked 103rd in overall ranking right now in this draft. I mean, it is not good, but, yeah, it's a position the Packers have to address at some point here, whether it's going to be in free agency or you're going to address it here. I mean, you do have McDuffie played good snaps last year. You know, you're going to get McDuffie back, but he's a role player. You need playmakers. I mean, we're talking, we're looking at guys like Fred Warner out there, who he is the 49ers defense. He is all over the place. And that's where you need to be if you are the Packers right now. You need playmakers. I think Quay can be that guy. I really do. But outside of that, like you said, I mean, we're we got holes there are holes to fill on this defense and where are you gonna fill them I it, it it's gonna be an interesting draft I, I in Gudikins we trust right we gotta trust Gudikins he surprised us before yeah. he might dip into this linebacker pool and pull out somebody who was fantastic right he might find a, a diamond in the rough in that linebacker room I don't know if he goes there right off the bat but you know they got an early second round pick there they got that Jets pick in that second round, and then they have their pick in the second, maybe a second round guy that this Packers team jumps all over. I, that's the only thing that I could see. I just can't see. You just got to be careful though. Second round. Yeah, I, I, yeah, like you were saying, like I think the guy I'm looking at is the 60th ranked prospect. But you know, like we were saying there, when you're reading off, I think the fifth guy you said was like a, ranked 130. I mean, you got to be careful. You got to make sure he's going to be there for that second round pick. Otherwise, you go from taking a guy that's ranked in the top two rounds to I think the next guy is ranked as like a fourth or fifth round linebacker and potentially a rotational piece. And that's not what we need. We need a starting linebacker. So, like you're saying, I, I don't want him to go linebacker. I want him to go cornerback. I want him. I want him to go tackle cornerback. But I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if they trade up early in the second round to try to get a linebacker because after these top two, three guys, it is like some of these guys, not all top, ten, all, not all of the top 10 linebackers are probably going to get drafted. No. That's how bad this room is. So you got to be careful, really careful with that linebacker group. It is definitely going to be an interesting draft. It is definitely going to be interesting for Green Bay to see which ways they head. I mean, we know we got our quarterback, right? We got our quarterback. The receiving room is fine. I, you would be, I could see Gudikins grabbing a receiver just because it's Brian Gudikins and he just loves to have, I mean, you can never have enough skill position players, right? You can never have enough. I just don't want to see him go to, I want to see him stretch. I don't want to see him stretch. I want to see him answer some of the other problems first year in this upcoming draft. So, I mean, with that, anything else you got to add, add on to the end here as the draft's coming up tonight? Uh, let's just all do a quick prayer for Cooper DeGene because that's the guy we want. That's so the guy we want. Hopefully we can come on here 
next week and talk about our new uh, starting safety, Cooper DeGene. Cooper DeGene or Joe Alt. We hope Joe Alt drops all the way down to 25 as the best offensive tackle we can grab him. We're all there. Please, for Brock Bowers drop. Please, Brock, Brock Bowers, Bowers drop. Please drop him there. Brock, I mean, we're open. We're open, right? I'll, I'll take Brock Bowers. Hear me now. I think I think he's going to be the best player out of this draft. I, I watch him play at Georgia, and that guy – will immediately be a top five ten, tight end. I mean, tight end in the league. And I don't know why teams are – I've seen him drop all the way down to 18. Yeah. I don't understand that whatsoever. He's a big guy. He can block. He's a great wide receiver. Just please don't let the Bears get him. The only way he drops out of five is if the Chargers trade up with the Minnesota Vikings and the Vikings go up to grab J.J. McCarthy. That's the only way I could see Brock Bowers making it past Jim Harbaugh. Because if Harbaugh gets his shot with Bowers, there is no way he doesn't bring him out there with Justin Herbert. That is, uh, that's just got to be it. I mean, there's no way. Yeah, and that's why I think at number nine, I think the Bears would take him because you listen to all these quarterbacks, and a qu- young quarterback's best friend is a tight end. Yep. A guy across the middle, a guy in the flats. So I think they got the wide receivers. I won't be shocked at all if Brock Bowers uh, falls to nine there if the uh, Bears take him. Oh, 100%. I mean, you look at Jordan Love, how much he progressed when Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft are both playing well. You saw how much better Jordan Love looked out there. I mean, I'm not saying that Jordan Love didn't have it and the receivers weren't helping out with that, but man, when those tight ends started to go, Jordan Love looked phenomenal. And you look at, I mean, Kittle, Kelsey, all of them, they make their quarterbacks look good. That's just how it is. So, I mean, I, we're hoping for a good draft, right? We're hoping for a good draft. We're hoping the Badgers find us somebody in the transfer portal, and we're looking for the Brewers World Series. We're just talking World Series right now. We want to see a World Series come back from Milwaukee. Dynasty. Just a dynasty, a dynasty is starting right now. We are starting a dynasty once Christian Yelich comes back from the injured list. Then the dynasty starts. Then it starts. <laughs> uh, Bucks. we're going to talk more about the Bucks tomorrow here on the show as we get into the weekend preview. But with that... This has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys back here tomorrow. But until then, deuces. Yeah, oh my Lord, watch me sway. Darkness falls and we all pray. Hoping for the light of day down to the river I have had.